give me a coffee and then I can barely hear it. It's good. I will. Can I take it out? I need that. Here's my name. I'll give it to you. Thank you very much. Oh, you have it. Oh, so this is for me. I'm out of here. This is my second visit to the McDowell Colony. The first was 60 years ago. Uh, I have not been back until now, not through any <coughs> unhappiness with my first visit. I will tell you about that visit. It was an enormously great, uh, I'm enormously grateful for it. I've just been busy. <coughs> One thing I did learn from my first visit to the McDowell Colony a long time ago was that it was doing something that practically no other organization in the United States was doing at that time, providing workspace, living space, and communal artist space for a variety of, of wonderful creative people. Now many, many people are doing it, but none of them has done it with the consistency <clears throat> or with the um, quality of participants that the McDowell Colony has done over the years. We are enormously grateful for that. I am myself. I'm one of these writers, or creative people, if you like that term, who decided very, very young that he was going to be involved in the arts. As I remember, I began writing poetry when I was eight. Uh, I stopped when I was 28, for reasons that I will tell you soon, basically because I wasn't getting all that much better. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, started doing drawings and paintings when I was about 10. And I um, discovered Bach when I was 11 and a half and decided, of course, that I had to be a composer. <laughs> My competence in most of these was minimal. But I persisted in being a writer, a poet. We all begin as a poet, do we not? <laughs> Knowing no better. And uh, eventually abandoning the novel as a hopeless enterprise for me, and knowing that the short story and I had lots of arguments about its nature, <laughs> and that the short story was probably right. <laughs> Though I must confess, I wrote a short story when I was 28, I guess, that had in it one of the best first lines of any short story ever written by an American. It was a short story set in Rome, Italy. And the first line, now believe me, it's a good one. <clears throat> the first line was, everything in Rome is uphill. <laughs> <clears throat> That's pretty good. <clears throat> Unfortunately, from that point in the story, everything was downhill. <laughs> But I persisted in being, being a writer and wrote, concentrated mostly on poetry for a very, very long time. Uh, I got in the habit when I was thrown out of college, when I was 18, uh, I moved to New York's Greenwich Village and decided, well, hell, I'm, I'm out, of, out, of, out of college, you know, I'm, I'm an adult. I might as well get to know some other writers and uh, show them my work and, and, and get their applause. <laughs> and there was a poet that I had heard had, was living in New York City, in Cornelia Street. <clears throat> and so I took, what, 20 or 30 of my poems, and I went to Cornelia Street and rapped on the door. 
and this guy was there, and he opened the door, and I, I thrust the poems at him, <coughs> and I said, my name is Edward Albee, I'm a poet, read these, I'll be back in a week. <laughs> he, he was so astonished that he'd taken the poems and stood there, mouth agape, as, 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 I, as I wandered away. A week later, to the day, to the hour probably, I went back to Cornelia Street and discovered he had not moved. <laughs> <laughs> he was still there, and having, even having read my poetry, he invited me in for a discussion. Very, very generous man, this guy, pointing out my excesses, my lapses, but being very, very careful to tread very gently on those poems of mine that were more obviously influenced by his. <laughs> For this man was W.H. Auden. <laughs> I mentioned this when I got to know Whiston very, very well in later years. I kept mentioning this event to him, and he pretended it had never happened. <laughs> Uh, it, 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 indeed, it had. So I was visiting a um, couple of years later, when I was, what, 23, perhaps, I was visiting a friend of mine who was in residence here at the McDowell Colony, a very good young composer named Bill Flanagan. I was visiting, and I was impressed by everything that was going on, thinking that maybe someday I'll get invited to the McDowell Colony, maybe, if I stop writing poetry, perhaps. <laughs> And I was wandering around the wonderful grounds, and I spied a shortish, balding man lurking in some pine trees. <laughs> I knew who he was, and I wanted him, even though he wasn't a poet, he was a writer, and I wanted him to read my poetry. <laughs> I had learned that no matter where I went, I always carried a small suitcase with me. <laughs> <coughs> of, my, of my work, you never knew when it was going to come in handy. <laughs> so I grabbed, I, I had committed many, many more poems by then, and, I, 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 and <laughs> I grabbed a handful of, of, of some of the newer ones and, and, and searched him out, and I found him lurking under another pine tree somewhere. <laughs> and I went into my act, and I said, my name is Edward Albee, I'm a poet, read these. <laughs> and thrust them at him, and um, he took them. And I guess he was a quick read, <laughs> because the next day he found me lurking under some other trees, and he said, Albie, I have read all of these poems. I want to take you out and get you drunk. <laughs> <coughs> well, you know what I thought, of course since the time I had shown my, my poetry to Auden, it had undergone a sea change and was now of a magnificence that could not be discussed sober. <laughs> <laughs> Turned out not to be the case. The guy just liked to drink a little bit. So he took me out in some beat up little car to one of the many pondlets that the dot down the New Hampshire countryside, and uh, with, a, with a bottle of bourbon. And uh, as the sun was setting, and as the level of the bottle of bourbon was settling, <laughs> he discussed each of my poems with me. Um, he did something I thought rather odd. Every time he finished discussing one of my poems, whether he did this on purpose or not, I don't know. Maybe the first time was accident. He, he sort of slipped it into the water. <laughs> <laughs> and by the time he had finished going over these 20 or 30 poems of mine, the entire surface of the pond <laughs> was covered with foolscap. <laughs> foolscap indeed. This man, whose name was Thornton Wilder, 
When you're that young, you dare anything. <laughs> when you're that young, you will show your work to the great because you feel that they deserve the experience <laughs> of your work. Wilder said to me a sentence that changed my life, which is why I'm telling you this entire story. He said, Albie, I have read these poems. I said, well, yes, there, I can see them all floating. <laughs> I have read these poems, Albie. Long pause. Have you ever thought about writing plays? I'm not trying to suggest that Thornton saw in the poetry the incipient playwright. I think much more likely he was trying to save poetry from me. <laughs> but seven years later, I, I took his advice and wrote my first play. And it was called The Zoo Story. And my life changed. I realized... Maybe I would have gotten to write poetry because I was so bad at everything else and I knew I was a writer. Maybe that was inevitable. But I think that Thornton's advice to give up poetry and, 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 and write plays uh, helped, me, helped me along. Um, it was an amazing advice to get. And I'll be eternally grateful to a writer who I think may have written the greatest play ever written by an American. That is Our Town by Thornton Wilder. His other plays aren't so bad either. <laughs> but I don't know why it is when the lists are made of the deathless American playwrights, for some reason Thornton's name is not on there very often. I think it's a great lapse a terribly important playwright, and somebody who had the generosity and the kindness to really be helpful, enormously helpful, to a young writer who could easily have been damaged by rejection. And he was generous enough to be kind. We got to know each other in, 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 in later years, as I did with, uh, uh, with Auden. But it was Wilder who pushed me and enabled me to, um, well, accomplish whatever I have accomplished so far. Um, I'm grateful to, the, to him enormously, grateful to the McDowell Colony for existing and for having him there at the time I happened to wander by. <coughs> I think possibly it is a place like this that you do tend to meet more often than you would otherwise. People who are very important to you. People who are going to be helpful to you and influential to you. You have a good place going here. You have to put together some extraordinary people. And I'm very happy to have been here twice. And uh, I hope I come back before another 60 years has passed. Thank you. Yeah.